Good afternoon and welcome to the Serious Security Seminar from Purdue University. Our speaker today is Professor Steve Elliott here from Purdue's Industrial Technology Department. Uh, Steve runs the biometric uh, lab here on, uh, on campus and he and his lab have been active in lots of different aspects of biometrics including testing and involved with developing standards. In fact, Steve uh, was the host for an international standards meeting here at Purdue about two years ago, yep. two, two and a half years ago. His uh, talk tonight, today is titled Biometric Technologies and Applications. Steve. Thanks, Randy. Okay, well, I'd like to start off by, by providing you with an overview of the lab and take you through some introductory comments about biometrics in general, give you an overview, and then um, concentrate on looking at the individual modalities and then go into some of the research activities that we've got going on in, in, in the lab currently. So for those of you that are not familiar with the lab, just want to give you an overview. Um, it was established in 2001 uh, to provide an applied research focus in biometrics. So for those of you that are interested in, in uh, coming over and taking a, a look at what we have, um, we're interested in making some of the products that we have in the lab work better than what they do currently. So we look at a wide range of different activities from performance, different demographics, uh, getting a little bit more information about subjects, videotaping them to see their interactions with the devices, all trying to get a better improvement or better performance uh, going on. So um, as we progress through this presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in. But we'll show you some actual experiments that we've been doing later on in, in, in the semester. We, uh, we concentrate on the following areas. We, we concentrate on biometric standards, performance analysis, and assurance of systems, with the, with the top two being uh, currently the most active uh, areas. In fact, one of my colleagues is in Singapore at the moment looking at an international standards meeting. And so biometric standards and the participation in that community gives us some ideas about where our current research needs to be done and some, some holes in, in the research and some opportunities for us. With respect to performance analysis, we, we're taking a look at, again, how devices in, uh, can be improved, uh, looking at the specific performance of those devices. And the assurance of systems, we, we look at uh, trying to figure out how to make them more secure and the like. We have uh, a couple of uh, CS students working in that environment at the moment. So as an introduction, really, there are a, a couple of ways to look at authenticating an individual's identity. The first one is um, what an individual has. And we have, if you take a look around in your wallet, you have uh, identification cards, cards, magnetic stripe cards, RFID cards, and the like to give you some form of access. Um, we're also interested from a, another point of view on what an individual knows or owns, a password, a PIN number, and the like and a biometric, and that's what we're going to concentrate on today, is what, an inf uh, what kind of information an individual has by their characteristics, their fingerprint or their face and the like. So when we take a look at biometrics, we split the groups into two different sectors. We've got physiological and behavioral. And so you've got hand, face, finger, iris, and vein on the physiological side. And on the behavioral side, you've got keystroke, signature, voice, and gait. Now, this isn't really, as you can see from the slide there, it's, it's uh, kind of two, two components, but really it's kind of a continuum here. If you take a look at the physiological side and the biological side, or the behavioral, sorry. And if you take a look at that, you've got, uh, say, face recognition. Well, you can sometimes change the behavior by changing your face or or growing a beard or doing or something like that. So we don't necessarily partition them in two sections there. The you know, face may sit here in some respects. Voice is another one where you've got a voice but sometimes you can mimic and, and change things around. So we this is kind of a continuum. You shouldn't really think of them as two two separate silos there. So those are the types of uh, biometric modalities that are most common. And we have in fact on the physiological side we have hand, face, both 3D and 2D, finger, iris, and vein in the lab. And on the behavioral side, we have all of those except for gait. So like I said, if you're wanting to come over and take a look at, feel free to do so. Now, some of the challenges associated with biometrics is that um, we've, we've got to make sure that everyone can be captured. Now, this is a little bit more of a challenge. Now we're trying to put these into monolithic systems, you know, stay uh, border control applications and the like, which makes life a little bit more complicated. And so, while we look at individual modalities, there are some combinations of modalities as well. See, finger and 
uh, skin or face and iris, we can combine modalities. Because we've got these various characteristics that we're interested in. First of all, that each person should have that specific trait. And in some cases, you might not have that trait. Now, you might be thinking, why not? But I might not have the uh, same number of fingers as someone else. I might not have um, availability to give the information. Um, unique, any two people should be sufficiently different. Now, this is sometimes a challenge. Um, when you consider twins, for example, um, you, you get two, different, two, two identical twins. You look at them, they look the same. Well, that's going to be the same challenge as we have in biometrics as well. And so there's been a lot of work being done on looking at uniqueness and twins. And colleagues up in Notre Dame University uh, go and collect twin data quite a lot to look at that. It's an active research area. If you're interested, you can go to their website. Collectible, we, we have these traits with us, but we need to make sure they're obtainable. So um, sometimes, for example, uh, when I go through the border, um, I have to get my fingerprints and... Sometimes it's hard for them to collect them. I don't have very good ridge definitions in my fingerprints. They're very poor quality prints. And so when I go to the border and they, they take a couple of times. So we're trying to figure out, you know, is it me that can't give it because I don't know how to use the device? Is it my characteristics that are the problem? Or is there something else going on? So they need to be collectible as well. And permanent. Traits sometimes vary over time depending on the trait. And so what we want to do is have repeatable measures, and sometimes uh, that's a challenge. Now, there are some cures to that. Template aging is one of those cures. But obviously, um, permanence of uh, the biometric characteristic is, is important. Unfortunately, we all age, right? So um, over a period of time, we'll, we'll, our, our features do change. So we've got to be uh, cognizant of that. And when you deploy biometric systems, you've got to be aware of all of these factors when trying to... Um, look at environmental issues and the like when you're going to put it on, are you going to put a hand geometry machine on the door, what is the environment, what is the population, if you're going to do face recognition, what is the lighting and so forth. We'll come on to some of those aspects later on. I want to spend some time now looking at the biometric system model because this is really fundamental to um, how biometrics work. And in terms of this model here, uh, it's really key to uh, everything. Most of the modalities follow this. So if we take a look at the red line as you go through, this is the enrollment line. You have a presentation and data capture silo there that really indicates that um, I'm going to say, for example, fingerprint. I'm going to present my fingerprint to a sensor. And uh, from that sensor, I'm going to grab a sample and I'm going to segment that, uh, the, the features out of that. I'm going to take the, the fingerprint away from the background. Then I'm going to look for particular features. Now let's say, for example, we're going to look at minutiae, the dots on the ridges and valleys where they end. I'll come show you some slides later on. But I'm after those features, and I'm going to extract those features, and I'm going to take a look at some form of quality control. I typically don't want poor quality images being put into the database to create the template. And then you can see, for example, I go from here, I create a template, and that template goes into that enrollment database. And that's important because that's where we store um, the, the, the templates for you to come back later on in matching. Now, for a hand geometry um, device, for example, I present my hand to the device three times, and it will make a template over these transactions, those three transactions. Other sensors, such as fingerprint, may require four or five. We have some in the lab that require eight or nine. So it really, really depends on the, the, the modality. But they all pretty much work the same. We're all trying to create a template that we'll subsequently use to do some matching. Now, one of the challenges with, with this part of it is that we typically create the template when you're first enrolled. So sometimes we want to get a, a, a user well habituated to the, to the device first. We don't want to get a sloppy um, uh, template. So we want to have you practice. And so that's one of the things you need to take into account is to train your user base in order to use the device properly because they're creating the template in their first go-round. Um, when you come back uh, again to be validated, say for example in, in hand geometry you come back, um, you present your biometric to the sensor again like you did for enrollment, it goes through the same process, but just before the template creation area here, this blue line bifurcates out of the, the red line and we come to matching. And so the template will get pulled um, and the sample will get matched against that. Now, it depends on the biometric modality on how this really happens. It's sometimes in a black box. But for hand geometry, for example, it's one-to-one. -one. I'll type my PIN number in, which will identify me. 
then it'll go grab that template from the database it will then match me against that sample and just do one match other modalities will go through the entire database one will, and we call that one to many there are one to few uh, there's all kinds of different um, matching methodologies here and then we get a similarity score and that similarity score will determine um, whether based upon some threshold we actually let you in or not so we either verify you or identify you depending on the, the mode of operation there and so that's the biometric model and it holds for most of the biometric modalities this uh, model by the way has gone through a couple of iterations um, Mansfield and Wayman created this in 2001, 2002 and the standards communities adopted this and it's, it's in most textbooks as the fundamental model that you go with um, some of the work that we're doing at, at the lab um, is kind of a kind of changing some of these things down here we're creating a new a new silo down here to look at some features and we'll come on to the reasons why later on but this is your basic uh, general biometric model and is is, is a very satisfactory um, introductory model you have there any questions over this before I go on okay so let's take a look at some modalities first of all we mentioned there were two types the physiological and behavioral sometimes they classify them slightly differently but we'll take a look at fingerprints, for example. If you see on the screen there, we've got a, a fingerprint. We have some minutia points. These red points at the top, you know, at the, the end and the beginning of, of the slide, of the, of the lines here. So if you kind of look at this, this item here, you have uh, two green lines, and uh, they, they meet together, and you have a little white line that starts. So you can look at these as ridges and valleys and where the ridges end and the valleys begin or vice versa we put a little red dot there and we have those um, coordinates and that line indicates the flow so this is a minutia based recognition there is pattern based as well but um, that's what we use for matching and that's after we've sampled the image now sometimes if you get a poor quality print as we'll see later on sometimes we get minutia points that don't always appear in the same area so that's a challenge for us because we're matching against that in, in minutia based matching at least and you'll see later on that we use uh, DET curves or ROC curves to determine performance and uh, minutia points are, and, and the quality of, of this image here is going to be important now later on you'll see that sometimes you'll get some cuts if you take a look at your fingerprints then there's there's no perfect print right so you might have a cut or a scar or, or, or something along those lines so when you put your finger down on the sensor you'll see that uh, cut and scar right away and then they've got to process it and many times you see this is a, a pretty good algorithm here you'll see that they'll process that out they'll, they won't create fake minu minutia points but this is fingerprint recognition this is how we do it we start off with the raw image you can see here, the, the different areas of the, the fingerprint, um, you can kind of tell its classification here with, with the, the flow of the ridges and valleys. You'll see up here some issues up, up here, it's probably a little bit dry. We're looking at the continuation here of the, of the ridges and valleys. And we binarize this, so we take this and we binarize it, then we skeletonize it to one pixel wide. And then from here, we go ahead and pull out these minutia points and the minutia extraction. So there's four, four levels that we do there. And this is fairly typical of uh, automated fingerprint feature extraction methodologies. So you can see some of our research is focusing on trying to get this print better. You know, if we take a look at it, there's, you can see kind of a, a line through the center where it may, might be a little bit dry or there might be some ink. In, inconsistent contact. We want to hold that thought and when we come back to research later on you'll see what an impact this uh, inconsistent contact and the like has against it. If you take a look at face recognition um, in, in 2D um, we're looking at uh, the extraction of about 10 to 30 points. Now you can see on that chart there uh, some of the points we're looking for eye location distances, distance between the eyes. We're trying to really locate the eyes first of all and, and go from there. Some of the photographs that we have in the lab um, are fairly poor quality and it's sometimes quite hard to even locate the eyes in these images. So you can see here this is a fairly full face, full frontal uh, face, no smile, nothing like that. So we can extract that information there. And this is out of the standard um, uh, data collection methodology so these are the features that we're looking at and again if you start altering these features or you start um, uh, covering some of them up then the algorithm is going to somewhat have a problem now we use eigen uh, eigen face extraction here and uh, 
you can see the images on there that, that, are the, that extract the face. Now, what we're interested in here, not only these points, but on 2D, we can move on to 3D. And you see here, we have a, a completely different layer of points, a lot more, a lot more points than, than the 2D face. And we've done some research in, in this area about four or five years ago, looking at 3D face. Now, the cost of the cameras is, uh, is a lot different. The 3D cameras are a little bit more expensive than the 2D. Um, we can do 2D you know, with a Logitech webcam or something like that, it's fairly good. But you see the 3D face, there's a lot more structure to it. And uh, we noticed in, in our studies that this performs uh, slightly better than some of the, the 2D methodologies. But you can see how we create that as well. This is a geometrics um, template here. We've got hand geometry. Now this is a, a, a very nice access control uh, application. It's a, a pin entry you can also use a, a card an RFID card or whatever and it's one-to-one -one. and you can see that we're taking a silhouette of your hand so you lay your hand down on the platen the platen is a reflectance surface the light will beam down onto your hand and then we get a we get a silhouette and then we measure the particular features around that and hand geometry is um, widely used for access control and time and attendance in fact it's probably the one of the most popular biometric modalities for that specific reason come on to some of that uh, applications later on. So you have iris recognition as well. Um, you can see here that there's a colored ring of texture surrounding the eye. So the white stuff around your eyes, your sclera, we take that out um, and we're left with the pupil. And there's uh, a lot of information that's uh, included in this area. So another area of research as well is looking at the quality of iris recognition Again, our lab does some performance analysis of that. Notre Dame has a good iris group as well. And uh, NIST has been doing some work on um, iris in the recent times called IREX, if you want to take a look at their performance evaluation reports. Basically, we take the image here, we segment it, we normalize it, we, we get um, basically, this is like a, a rubber inner tube, and we stretch that out here, so we get a normalized image, we extract the feature, and we get an iris code. And this iris code is what is used to match the devices, uh, the irises, sorry. Vein recognition is another one. Now, there's several ways of doing vein recognition methodologies. The cameras all use near-infrared light to capture the vein, but there's the top of the palm vein capture, there's finger vein, and there's the bottom of the palm vein cameras as well. So there's three different types, and they're all made by three different companies. Um, TechSphere is the one that measures up here, Hitachi does your finger, and uh, Fujitsu does the, the bottom of the, uh, does the palm. And these uh, are being used in areas where, for example, TechSphere will be used in access control in a similar way that the recognition systems device would be used. Um, we use the um, Hitachi finger vein at the airport to make sure that students gain access to the flight sims. So we have that uh, deployed out there as well, and that uses a single finger. And then we also have the Fujitsu one, and uh, they're marketing that to kind of the healthcare environment because it doesn't necessarily require too much contact. There is a, a, a thing that holds your hand, but you don't actually make contact with the sensor. So there's uh, three different types of vein cameras, and you can see them here um, with the respective images associated with that. So that's another area of of um, research. We have all three devices actually in the lab and it's another area of interest as we look at different modalities. Keystroke dynamics, well this measures how people type on the keyboard and uh, it's, it's fairly simple. You look at different uh, key press uh, and key interval times and you measure those and you determine whether those uh, people are available. Now it's kind of ironic, well, there's keyboards everywhere but keystroke dynamics really hasn't taken off that, that much but it has a lot of potential and um, there's some active uh, research work being done in a lot of groups on, on how to do this. One of the challenges we have here is obviously interoperability, where you've typed in, you're used to your keyboard, and then you go to someone else's keyboard, and it takes a little bit of time to get used to that. And so that's a, a challenge there. Signature verification, again, uh, not used as much as it could be, but there are definitely some groups out there looking at this. Um, it's used to see how people sign their name. You can't see it very well. It's not very clear, but you can capture this is a, an electronic e-pad 
it's about 90 to 100 bucks you might have used some at point of sales we can capture the time it takes for you to sign and some 90 other variables this particular algorithm is about 91 variables that we capture as you sign your name so this is uh, another methodology and so we get down to selecting really which one's best so if you take a look at all of these modalities um, it's really quite a challenge to figure out which one to use for particular applications um, if we start off with fingerprint for example which type of methodology do I use do I use a touch sensor do I use a thermal sensor do I use a capacitance sensor do I use an optical one do I grab one finger two fingers four fingers do I go like this and, and do a slap like they do in the immigration which one do I choose which methodology methodology do I choose um, and this is some other work that we've been doing is interoperability all of, of all of this so if you have a group of people that buy buys laptop A and it has company A's sensor on it and then you migrate them all over to company B sensor there's some interoperability issues you have to make sure so you don't have to enroll everybody so this is a big big decision to make face recognition do I go with 2D or 3D how do I capture the images what is the quality of the image that's important to know in terms of understanding it Hand geometry, obviously that's uh, pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. You, you, you got to put it on the wall, but how do people interact with it? How do we train people to use it? Um, what height? All of these kinds of things. We've done some research in flipping it on its side, so it's like a handshake, so it's maybe more ergonomic, ergonomically intuitive. All kinds of things we've been working on there. Iris recognition, a lot of the devices that we have in the lab are uh, non-mobile. So um, you have... Uh, three devices in the lab that are that are stationary. One of the challenges that we have is to get people to learn how to use this on a regular basis. Now, there's Iris deployed at Heathrow Airport. I use it all the time when I go home, and uh, I can get through it relatively quickly. But there are three cameras at three different heights, so to take into account the small, medium, and and tall people, and. Um, so there's there's the ergonomic issue there, making sure that I can line my eyes up properly and, and the like. With uh, other devices we have in the lab, the depth of field, um, usability is key there. We also have a mobile iris camera, and there's some usability issues on that. So that's another focus of our of our research is not necessarily adapting the cameras, but to make them make the humans interact with them a bit quicker. Vein, we talk keystroke interoperability is obviously important there. Signature. How you sign is important, the ceremony in which you sign. So if you get done at Harry's at 2 o'clock in the morning, you might not sign as well as if you're signing your mortgage. And then if you're signing your mortgage, you got like 20 or 30 sheets of paper and it keeps on coming. And then after a while, you get tired. Imagine if you're writing a paper essay instead of typing. After a while, you start shaking your hand, your hand gets tired. So we want to look at all of those characteristics to see whether it's really you signing or not. So there's a lot of interesting research opportunities here. And uh, one of the challenges is that we're looking at whether um, biometrics can differentiate between a genuine user and an imposter user, given that you're not necessarily going to present the same image the, twice. So that's, that's a challenge. And we want to minimize intra-class variability and maximize inter-class variability. And that's our key. We want to make sure that you keep repeating the same and you don't come into someone else's space. And that's not as easy as we make it out to be. So we have some, er some errors that, that we've started with a framework. Now, this is a, a very high-level framework. It really depends on a couple of issues on, on how the biometric system works. But we look at false matches and false non-matches. There's also another way of looking at it, false accepts and false rejects. But basically what we're looking at is to try and differentiate individuals from each other. And if you take a look at here, you've got two different things, false match and false non-match. If you take a look at false match, it's deciding that two biometric samples are from the same individual when they're from different individuals. And the false non match is deciding that two biometric samples are from different individuals when they're from the same one. So these, these kinds of ideas enable us to plot curves and to assess performance of biometric devices. Some of our work in standards has tried to figure out how to do testing. And this is a, a big question because when you look at an immigration system or a banking system or something like that, you can't test large swaths of the population. It's, it's quite difficult to get that. Some of the tests we do in the lab hit about 250 people, and that's quite a large data, data sample to, to do some analysis on. But there are three types of test methods in order to help us characterize um, these, um, the, the approach that we should take. First of all is technology, 
And that's really taking a look at the algorithm. Is algorithm A better than algorithm B? And this comes from a single technology. The scenario which we've just come off of for one uh, uh, study that we've done is to determine how the whole thing works in a simulated application. So if we were to mimic, for example, um, uh, maybe a border application or mimic a single sign-on application, something like that, that would be a scenario goal where we don't actually physically take you to the border and have you do stuff. And an operational one is exactly that. It's out in the field. It's actually working uh, how, you, how you intend to make it use. And then the population comes through and, and we grab data from that in a, in a live scenario, uh, a live operational test. So there's, there's three methods. Most of the activities that we do in the lab, we collect data out of scenario and then we do some technology tests as well. We rarely get into this operational um, testing at all. One of the challenges that we have with respect to collecting data is to get people from a wide variety of populations in order for us to take a look at certain things that kind of interest us. Um, and our first research projects that we first started off was um, basically surrounding the issue of sample quality. Now this was about 2001, 2002 when we started this work and we looked at fingerprints. The devices were fairly cheap, the algorithms we had available to us. And we wanted to take a look at really what is quality? How do you define quality? That's not a trivial exercise, by the way. And so there are, the standards community has worked on this. There are companies that provide us with quality tools. And there's three different types. One is the character, the character quality of the sample. And this is based on inherent features of the source. The second is fidelity, and this is based on the accuracy and representation of the source. And the third is utility, which based on the contribution of these samples to the error rates in the data set. So we take all of these three things and we try and understand a little bit more about performance. And this is where we come on to uh, research projects that uh, surround something called, we call HBSI, and that's Human Biometric Sensor Interaction. Now, this is quite a challenge to understand. We have, um, if, if I go to here, we have um, groups of people, so I'm going to do stick impressions here, people coming into a particular device. I, I didn't do art very well in, in any, any school, middle grade or high or college. And so they're going to come in and use the system. So we're interested in getting them through as quickly as possible, right? So we want throughput, right? We don't want to get people delayed. So if we take an airport scenario, you've been on the plane for nine hours or 12 hours or however long it is, you really don't want to be lined up in the immigration line as long as you know, you want to get through quickly. So we want to provide this individual with good samples. So say, for example, you've got a frequent flyer. They come through the immigration line all the time. They should be used to interacting with the device, and off they can go. We assume they present good samples. You've got, say, your parents that come across every year or so. They're not maybe used to interacting with the devices a lot. They slow the line down a little bit because they don't know how to present their biometric features to the device, or the quality is not as good. Well, we want to figure out how to get your parents through the line a little bit quicker. We, we have a good idea about how these guys operate. We're trying to figure out how people that aren't trained, aren't habituated to the devices, aren't familiar with it, how do they work? How do they operate? Some of the interesting things we found is that you can kind of get used to things and they might not be used to the right devices. For example, we did a swipe test where you got a fingerprint sensor and you simply swipe your hand, you swipe your finger over this test. And then we did another test which was where you plunk your finger down and people started swiping. It was like, not a swipe test. But they were trained because we did three or four swipe studies that when they came in, that's how they did the fingerprint. It was a completely different interaction. So we take a look at HPSI and we say, well, how do we figure out to improve maybe the interaction of the person without even going near the algorithm? How do we improve that? Is it their physical interaction? Is it some behavioral uh, items going on? Social factors, maybe they don't want to use it. And does the environment add to our problems here? So here you've got a conceptual mod model. And uh, up here you've got the human, you've got the sensor, and the biometric system. And here you've this intersection between the human and the sense, you've got ergonomics. So how do I remember that general biometric model at the very beginning? You had the first side of was presentation to the sensor. Well, if we can get that individual to present good quality images, even if they've not very good, very good biometrics, right? So for me, I have lousy fingerprints. If you get me to present properly, give me as much guidance as, as you can, 
then maybe I can get through the system and maybe I can present uh, better, better samples. So you've got this ergonomic, maybe it's the device that I'm not used to using. I kind of always spread my fingers out. There's not a lot of gap. There's, there's that much space. So I go like that and I, I, never, I don't know how to use it sometimes. I, I do, but I, whatever. So sometimes the angle might be different. How many people are left-handed? One. There's always one, right? So we make worlds for right-handed people and you have to adapt. So signature is a classic example of this interaction between human and the sensor. You go to Best Buy or you go to Target or something, they ask you to sign. How do you sign your name? Do you write like, do you write like that or do you write like that? I actually write right-handed. Great. That, that blows that hypothesis. <laughs> and we're on TV too. All right. But assume that you're, assume you're right like that, right? So when, uh, one, one of the classic things um, that I did wrong when I was doing my PhD when I set up my methodology, I soon changed that really quickly. I didn't, I didn't pay any attention, I guess. My advisor was left-handed. So I set up my experimental design, got it right for me. I sat there and signed my name thousands of times. You know, oh, this works, this works. He comes down and he signs like this. Signs his name like that. And all the stuff that I had here, I didn't pay any attention to because I cleared my right-hand side. I didn't clear my left-hand side. And so one of his complaints was, well, every time he goes to Best Buy, every time he signs, he has to adapt the way he signs because we're used to signing that way. Take a look at a lefty next time when they sign. They sign and the, the point of sale isn't designed for that. So that's, a, that's an issue that we need to take into account. Usability, image quality, all of these factors. And this, this kind of intersection of everything is what we call the human biometric sensor interaction model. So we, we address on how do users uh, interact with biometric devices, what errors do they make, and they make a lot more errors than we originally anticipated that they would. Um, what common errors or issues do users face, um, and how can we stop them from doing that? And then lastly but not least, how do you train people? I mean, give them the manual, but many people don't. When was the last time you guys read a manual when you bought a piece of electronics? No, you think you're clever enough to just plug it in and go, right? And then you troubleshoot, but that's fun of it, right? This is a challenge, right? So how do you train people? We, you know, do you learn visually or do you learn another way? How do we figure this out? And we're all trying to do this because we, we want to increase that performance rate. So this is uh, something that we've got going on in the lab. We have a special lab devoted to this. And um, you can see this is one example. Now we've got a, a, a person down here interacting with the fingerprint sensor, the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. And they're swiping the finger from here downwards. Okay? And as they're swiping from here downwards, we're videotaping, we're capturing a screenshot of the interaction of that to the sensor. So many times, well not many times, but sometimes you might get the case where someone will swipe their finger and the sensor doesn't recognize it. It just goes blank. Well, that's an error but it's not recorded by the system. So we have to figure out what to do with that error because it was an interaction. Sometimes that interaction may be correct. The sensor doesn't pick it up. Sometimes the sensor picks it up and the interaction was like kind of a whoopsie. I, I kind of started and I stopped and I messed up or I used the wrong finger or I did something stupid. That, that, that stuff on me really shouldn't be taken into account into the metrics of the sensor. It captured it. it you put the wrong finger down. It can't stop you from doing that. So. What we do is we take a videotape of that. We make sure that you can see there's a little blue dot there. It's, it goes across each finger. We make sure that you're using the right finger, you're using the right hand, everything works together. And then we videotape it, and then we sit there and classify it. And it takes quite a while to classify uh, a lot of data. I think our, our last, we haven't analyzed the data yet, but we have 100 plus 150 hours, 250 hours worth of data, I guess. A videotape to go through and classify. So this is a kind of a non-trivial exercise to find errors. But one of the interesting things is you can see how people error visually as opposed to going back into the log files and go, well, there's a particular type and you might be able to go back and reclassify it. So let's take a look at some of our research activities in the, the last, I guess, 15 minutes. Again, when I first started this uh, conversation with you, we looked at performance. Now this is age. This was our first study. Um, and uh, we keep coming back to this cause it's fundamental in some of our understanding. Now this is a fairly old algorithm. This year we're going to rerun the data on two newer algorithms to see whether these curves have shifted. But if you take a look at, a, at, at the curves up here, you've got false accept across the bottom, false reject on the side here, and, you, and you've got an ROC curve there. This isn't wonderful. This is really good. Okay. 
So what we want to do is to get this curve to go down there. If it goes up there after some intervention, we've made things worse. All right, so we want it to come down, and it might come down like that. It might come down. It might come down any which ways, but it's nice to get a, 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 a operate a good operational line here. So you can see here in this slide on the top graph that's good performance and here's not so good performance. So what might bring that on? Well if you take a look what would be the characteristic differences between fingerprints on 18 to 25 year olds and 62 and above? What would be a challenge? Maybe it's quality. Maybe people are 62 and above have done a lot more with their hands, they might have abraded their fingerprints, they might have poor quality skin, all kinds of things. So when we look at um, fingerprints now, we collect moisture, elasticity, oiliness, we take temperature of the skin, take the temperature outside, one day it'll warm up, right? So uh, sometimes now your, your hands, your skin might be different to what it is in the summertime where you go somewhere nice and warm, kind of your skin changes. So we take a look at that and you can see the quality scores here. Um, and you can see these cuts and striations of the 62-year-olds and above, which if you take a look here, that's what we're trying to, um, that's what the algorithms will be looking for. You see that line straight across there. That would yield a bunch of false minutia points, and so we want to extract that and make sure that gets filled in. We've looked at force as well. So when we, when we look at this type of study, we're like, okay, how can we make fingerprints better quality? One of the challenges we've noticed is force. Now, when you put your finger, say you ink your fingers and you press it simply down on a sheet of paper, the force that you do, it, say you use uh, hardly any force at all, the image that represents on the paper is going to be very, very light. That is exactly the same as uh, an optical sensor. Now these are optical images on the top, capacitant images on the bottom. They, it, it works slightly differently. So the more I put my finger down, the maybe the darker the image will be to a point where I, I squash all the ridges and valleys together because I put so much force down on it. So somewhere along the line there's a sweet spot. Is there an optimal force um, for us to go ahead and, and recommend to give guidance to people that are using the devices? So instead of just going go boom, 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 boom like in immigration, go hit it until, put your fingers down until you hit a certain value. You know, you go to PEFQ for example, that's a swipe. No, it's not. It used to be a swipe. Now it's a touch. Um, you, you go there. What is my finger meant to look like? Now, Pefki do a really good job of putting a fingerprint that it's meant to look like beside you, so you can move your finger around and get guidance. That means they don't have to attend to it. They don't have to baby you or anything else like that. There's your image. There's your finger. You've got to make it the same. It gives you guidance. So that's what we're trying to do in HBSI is to give you better, better hints and tips on how to use it, especially for these non-habituated people. It might be easier for people that don't use it often to go, i, I got to come in and i got to hit that 9 value or whatever it is. I plunk my hand down, I hit 9, we're good to go, we off, off we move. So that's kind of the research that we're looking at is maybe stop go lights or something like that, which helps you to do that. So what's the difference? We bring the curves in. That's the simple thing. All right? We notice that um, when we bring the force levels to an optimum level that we get from... Um, certain individuals we, we get the, the values improved. So we got some flat lines here and in other force levels we don't. That's a good thing. So you can see we try and bring it down. So at 3 newtons you saw the image wasn't very good. It's going to have a harder time to extract. Then at 7 newtons it looks like we're getting we're get making progress. And then down here this kind of blue, green and off yellow color I guess we got a flat line. So there's, there may be a sweet spot in there. So more research is being done now we're, we're working on temperance. It's a little bit more complicated because um, there's more, more pressure points there. So that's a, an aspect of doing it. I alluded to earlier the different types of fingerprint sensors. Well, you can see here, which one do you choose? This is a you know, $100 million question for implementation people, right? Which ones do I choose? Well, you can see that I've got different images. I've got an Atmos swipe. We've got a group of optical uh, sensors. We've got a group of capacitive swipes and a group of capacitive touch. So all different interactions. They're all going to yield different quality. Um, people are going to prefer one over the other. And so this is a challenge that you have to deal with. Sometimes you don't get a choice. You buy a laptop, you buy a laptop, it comes with a sensor. I haven't heard many people. How many people have a fingerprint sensor on their laptop? And for the audience that's on the TV, no one raised their hand. I don't normally get one or two. In my big class of 80 students, I have three people that have fingerprint sensors on their laptop. 
They bought it because the fingerprint sensor was built in. It didn't cost any more. It was kind of cool. They were kind of interested in it. But they didn't buy it for the sensor type. So if you go out and get a, get a computer and you get the sensor type, then you get rid of it or it's centrally stored or whatever it is, you've got to think about how to manage the interoperability. So uh, Dr. Modi, who is uh, in the lab as well, has done a research paper on fingerprint sensor interoperability. And if you're interested, there's going to be a webinar. If you go to our website, there's a webinar um, on fingerprint sensor interoperability coming up in February time. And he'll go through the data. But he's interested in if I enroll on one and verify on the other, does the performance change? If I enroll on the same one, does the performance change? How does all of this interact? What is the sensor-dependent variations and distortions? Characteristics of the sensor? How do we figure this out? Design some models to predict effects and then take a, take a look at the results. That's another aspect that we're looking at. One of the other challenges, obviously, it's not just face, it's not just finger, sorry, uh, image quality we're after. We're also looking at improving face um, image quality, iris image quality and the like. But if we take a look at face, if you get a, a lousy photograph, it's, what are the chances are that it's not standard compliant, that it might not work? First of all, we haven't talked much about standards. But we want to know, if I'm going to make a photograph standard compliant, you've seen the ID pictures where you've got to stand there, take a photograph, don't smile, stare at the camera, and you know, that kind of glum face. At least four or five of you are demonstrating it right now. So you got that, you got that look on you, and you take a photograph. Well, what happens if it's not such a good photograph? We want to use that in law enforcement. So we've been working, um, looking at um, mugshot photographs and trying to figure out the quality of that whether we can make a lousy quality photograph a uh, good quality, make it standard compliant, taking a look at that. Also trying to figure out to try and teach people how to take a photograph, which may seem fairly trivial, point a camera and click, but many times people get from here up to the face, and sometimes they get uh, no face at all, and you know, it depends on all kinds of things. So what we're trying to do is get a methodology. Do you plant two feet on the ground, tell them to stand there? What do you do to get people to take a good photograph? Same with iris in some respects. How far away from the sensor do you need to be? Stand right there, you're good to go. Um, one of the studies we did about four or five years ago, we put a hand, uh, an iris machine on the wall and someone stood like 10 feet away. And we're like, that's a long way away. Yeah, that's where I think I should stand. Okay, well, you need to go like a foot away. Well, it wasn't intuitive to him. We did a whole, this, this got our interest, of course, a whole ton of people through. And it varied. And none of them stood a foot away. They all stood like three feet away or five feet away. That's not good for throughput and operational. Nothing wrong with the algorithm. It just didn't give the user any guidance on how to do stuff. Um, so going back to face, what we're looking at is uh, trying to see quality, trying to provide a best practice to that. Other, other ways you're looking at it is um, passport photographs. There's my happy face again. Um, trying to figure out whether people can um, identify um, against image quality analysis is a good photograph what is a good photograph and how do we do it many of the software vendors out there have 20 or 30 different variables on uh, to make up quality so we're trying to figure out what is the most important um, for the DOC at least what is the, the most important aspect of that when it comes down to a remote authentication using biometrics uh, there was a report done by NIST uh, there's the number on it it's technical authentication framework for remote e-authentication it's available on the Insights website, um, which is incits.org. And um, it was a debate about uh, the difference between cryptography and biometrics and, and uh, how to classify biometrics to look at their different levels. So um, I would advise you maybe to take a look at that. If you're interested, you know, I think it needs updating. Personally, it's been a while since that, that topic was tackled. But when it was done, it was done by a grad student of mine, Matt Young, and, and some, some other people. And, and, and it's really quite an interesting framework. It made us sit down and think about it. For example, uh, there was some discussion that biometrics aren't suitable for secrets for remote authentication. But there's a lot of challenges with remote authentication, period. When you add biometrics, it adds a little, uh, you know, something more interesting. We're doing a bit, bit of work in the lab on, on this. We've done some work in the past on, on authentication. Um, it's a challenge, and uh, we're interested in people that want to come in and, and take a look at this. One of the uh, debates that we have ongoing in the lab is trying to identify people, say, on distance education. I never see you. You log in. How do I really know it's you? What's going on? 
Um, how do I do identify now? You might be able to maybe keystroke dynamics, how people type remotely on the keyboard. Then we have to get some templates and everything else. I have to figure out a schematic for that. Um, you don't, do you want to do face recognition? You don't want to do fingerprint maybe, or do you? It's up to you, I guess. But how do you, you know, you can't have a pop-up screen in the middle of an exam. Say so it's time to re-authenticate. How do we deal with this? It's, it's a challenge. And uh, we're looking at um, that kind of research area as well. Another uh, research topic that we have going on is Java Bio API. We've been plugging away at this one for a long time, maybe four or five years. Now, standards don't happen to be made overnight, which is a good thing. But this is a collaboration with Sirius uh, that is, is, has done quite well. We have uh, a group in Spain, I think, that is interested in, in taking this a little bit further and testing this out. But it's an API, Bio API, and we've converted that over to uh, Java Bio API. And so that's work that CS students have done maybe for the last three years, I think. It's about three years project. Something else we're looking at is biometrics in healthcare. Um, at the Biometrics Consortium Conference in Tampa in 2009, there was a whole panel on um, biometrics and trying to figure out how to use it. Um, there's Obviously, you can use it in single sign-on environments, but patient ID is one issue that they were looking at. Um, access to drug boxes or drug cabinets is another area of, of where biometrics is going to be used. But sometimes we get um, a little, some people there's some debate that biometrics might necessarily not be good for that environment. Say for example, nurses um, wash their hands a lot, there's uh, maybe, maybe get poor quality skin. So we decided we'd go ahead and take a look at this. You can go online quite easily and find a whole ton of myths and misconceptions about biometrics. It's not difficult to come by, especially when people might not want to use them. Now, it might be a valid issue when people say, well, it needs to work first time otherwise because I'm in an emergency or a hospital environment, I'll find a workaround. But that's true of most things. What we wanted to take a look at is the fingerprint image quality scores. And um, you can see here blue is the general population, red is the healthcare group. The quality scores were slightly different, but these were not statistically different at all. You can see the performance is not as good as the blue group, but still wasn't that bad. Nothing that would prevent biometrics from being used in that environment. And um, if you're interested, we've got a LinkedIn group on biometrics and healthcare, which you just started off to solicit ideas from the healthcare community on, on why they might or might not use biometrics. And biometrics and cryptography, got a couple more minutes left. Um, this is some of the work that um, we've done on and off. Um, Elisa Bertino's group in um, Sirius with identity management has been looking at biometrics and cryptography, and uh, they have got some proposals out there. Very IDX is an example of that. So that's something they've been working on. And um, another project that we've been looking at is uh, with respect to biometric information lifecycle. And that is a project that is also being done in conjunction with Sirius. Looking at when do we get rid of a biometric, how do we delete it, how do we, get, how do we deal with its life cycle? You create it, we store it, what happens when you're done with it? It's your biometric. Okay. So how do we delete it from the system? Um, I was enrolled in a couple of systems that are no longer um, currently in operation. I didn't get my biometric back. Right? It's, do we need to get it back? What do we need to do with it? How do we need to structure? This is maybe a policy issue as well, but it's something that we should deal. Something that we should deal with. So um, Keith Watson at Sirius and uh, Dr. Modi has been working on the information lifecycle as well. The goal is to look at a model that can be used for creating better policies um, relating to and identifying vulnerabilities in the management processes of biometric devices. So I'm just about to run out of time. We've got about a, a minute left. If you're interested in learning more about um, biometrics, there's a class. I want to show you the website because apparently it's not up. Here's the website. If you're interested, there's some slides on the Biometric Consortium webpage. And uh, it's a good historical thing. It goes back to 2002, I believe. And you can have a look at how you know some of this stuff has waxed and waned and some biometrics go in a fashion and they go out of fashion and they come back in again. It's kind of cyclical. Um, so that's our website there. Go and take a look on that. We also post um, all our papers there on SlideShare and, and the like if you want to go download them. And we also have some webinars that are available. You can sign up for those on that website and uh, the Adobe presenter there dial in. Does anyone have any questions? 
done. Okay, pretty much done.